Last time we looked deep into the first part of the weather top scene and ended with a conclusion that the campfire was not a mistake but lit deliberately as Frodo's and his friends last line of defense in the book. We will directly continue from here. There are a lot of details and especially differences in the following section. I said it already several times but this is one of my favorite parts of the books because of this. As always I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it. Spoiler warning and shoutouts to Kimberly80, Niati and Benef for allowing me to use their fantastic artwork. After Frodo quickly puts out the fire with his foot in the film we see again this nice shot of Weathertop and the fire vanishing in the dell as it's called in the book while we still hear Pippin talking about food which echoes through the grassland until we hear the chilling Nazgul scream which as we learned was a sound produced by a sick friend Welch that got slightly edited I assume. The book also describes that Ringwraith did squeaking noises. The Weathertop Hill we see here exists in reality too. It's in New Zealand, as far as I know, south of Port Waikato. Of course the ruins were added digitally. Digital matte painting I assume. Now we come to a scene that could be a slight reference to a dream Frodo once had in the book. Quote from the chapter A Conspiracy Unmasked. Eventually he fell into a vague dream in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below among the roots there was the sound of creatures crawling and snuffling. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. And at the end of the passage… Suddenly he found he was out in the open. There were no trees after all. He was on a dark heath and there was a strange salt smell in the air. In the film Frodo sees this dark and empty land with some twisted trees and the Nazgul getting closer to him. With the fog it has something dreamlike too but I guess the comparison is a bit stretched. But let's say this scene in the film and the description in the book awake a similar feeling. The books are however very different now. What is similar is that the scene in the book and the film play at night and we see the moon, an important detail for the book. As explained before, there Frodo and his friends including Aragorn sit close at the campfire and the ranger tries to bolster the hobbits up by telling them about the ancient law and he sings a translation of the song of Beren and Luthien. This is another little detail we need to understand the scene. In the film Frodo, Sam, Merry and Pippin see the Nazgul and move from their dell at the side of Weathertop up to the ruins. They just walk up a path with stairs and are at the ruin. In the book we learn that they need to climb for half an hour to reach the top from their camp. However, as already mentioned, here the fire is their line of defense and they have it lit deliberately. They don't move to the ruin during the attack at all in the book. As mentioned last episode, Aragorn also explains a few things about the nature of the Nazgul. The horses are real horses and those see the physical world, the so called seen, while the ring wraith can only see the unseen, also called race world. In the unseen they only percept, so to say, shadows of other normal beings. Aragorn described it quite well, our shapes cast shadows in their minds. The noon sun however can destroy those shadows which makes it hard for the black riders to see normal beings at daytime. However, they smell the blood of living things desiring and hating it. Also Sauron can wield fire for his uses but the Nazgul hate it and fear those who wield it. We also learn that there is nothing under their cloaks because the ring wraith themselves live in the unseen and only their black cloaks, which are real too, make them actually visible or give them a shape. I got an interesting comment a while ago, shoutouts to the only true witch king. In his comment he compared them to beasts. They fear fire, communicate with other animals who can be their allies, they smell the blood of other living beings, they are powerful in the dark where they hunt their prey, the one who carries the ring and men fear them at night the most. 
very beast-like, but in a way they are also like inverted men. They fear those who don't respond with fear to them and stand against them, while we as humans usually applaud people who stand against, for example, injustice or danger with courage and see them as heroes, the Nazgul exactly fear those. Men learn to wield fire and use it as a tool, but the ring wraiths hate and fear it. Men got corrupted by their desire for power and might, wishing to transcend death and the human form, but the Nazgul have reached this and now smell the blood of living things, desiring and hating it. The idea of them desiring the living is a really interesting detail. I find this concept and Tolkien's descriptions and ideas regarding the ring wraith truly fascinating and see a lot of deep thought in them, but they are also very interesting foes for this part in the story. Tolkien manages to bring all the red lines of thousands of years of lore together to this point that gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. The films only manage to catch this feeling of having these terrible foes against you. There is simply no not enough time in a film to explore this further, but in the books you understand everything better under the hood, pun intended. So the hill is much smaller in the films, no 30 minutes climb for the hobbits and the Nazgul would probably take even longer to get there too. This is the time and space magic of the medium film. It would ruin the pacing if the hobbits would need to wait for half an hour for the Nazgul and where's Aragorn all the time? Waiting in film can be a tool to create suspense and here it's also used to start the magic moment when the Nazgul appear at the outer parts of the ruin, fading in like ghosts. I love the idea and how it's filmed. You ask yourself, how will the hobbits survive this? They are paralyzed by fear. We also see the sharp edged armored boots and gauntlets of the black riders. They look like they would hurt you when you just accidentally touched them. Beautiful custom design. Then they draw their swords and we hear a classic draw sword sound. A sound engineer or foley artist from the Lord of the Rings films said in an interview, he doesn't know why but when you use a different different moralistic sound, it feels wrong when you see the scene. People seem to be so used to the sound that you can't change much. Their sounds look old but deadly and terrifying too. Even though the Black Riders wear some armor, they move so silently and ghost-like. We learned why there are only five Nazgul instead of all nine in the previous episodes. Frodo's friends try to defend their friend but are no match and simply push to the side and ignored like they were not even there. If you look closely it looks a bit funny when they get pushed to the side. The difference in size is of course realized with scale doubles, well planned camera shots and editing. Frodo stumbles while walking backwards and falls to the ground. We see water on the ground, no sign of Gandalf's fiery fight from three days ago. The only thing Frodo can now do is use the one ring to hide. The feeling of using it overcomes him and the Nazgul now are certain what drew them. He must be the ring bearer. Using the ring Frodo moves into the unseen and can now see the Nazgul as they are. I really like the visuals here and they fit the description from the book very well. Details we do not see. The blade of Frodo, one of the barrow blades from the downs, should be glowing red. Of course in the film he does not have a barrow blade and the Morgul knife of the Witch King also had a pale glow. Now the ring rays themselves and their weapons have that pale glow all over them. I also love the shot where the camera follows the knife. Sauron and the Nazgul at this point won. All they needed to do is kill the one who carries the one ring and take it back to their master. After the knife pierced through the bearer's heart, he would in addition become a lesser race under the control of Sauron who would torment him for taking his ring. We see how Frodo tries to resist the one ring pulling towards the Nazgul so they can take the ring and Frodo is even successful and pulls the ring back. 
The Witch King is not happy about this and stabs him with the Morgul knife. But for some reason the Witch King did not pierce Frodo's heart. He stabbed him into the shoulder. Frodo screams and suddenly sees a shape with a torch in his hand in front of him. Frodo pulls the ring from his finger screaming. But Aragorn, the heir of Elendil, who once met here at Weathertop with the elven army of Gilgalad, forming the last alliance of elves and men and the descendant of the kings of Arnor, is protecting his friends and Weathertop the top from the witch king of Angmar and the other Nazgul again like in the days of old. History is repeating itself and as a powerful man who has no fear and wielding fire and the broken sword of Narsil in the book which is different in the film he manages to defeat the Nazgul for now. This was also the first scene Viggo Mortensen shot and he had no time for training because Peter Jackson recasts the role of Aragorn in the last moment, feeling the need for an older actor for the role. Viggo basically just came out of the plane. It's quite sad for Stuart Townsend who was in training for two months at this time already and suddenly lost his job out of nowhere. From a viewer's perspective we know Viggo Mortensen worked really well as Aragorn but it must have been devastating for Stuart Townsend. This is also the film's perspective but there are still some questions open. Why did the Witch King stab Frodo's shoulder? Frodo was in the unseen and the Witch King could clearly see him but it's the same in the book. There Frodo gets stabbed in the shoulder too. In the film we see Frodo resisting and exactly here lies a reference towards the book. As mentioned all this is very different there but the book also gives us many answers that lie in many little details. As mentioned in the book Aragorn stays with the hobbits at the campfire in the dell. At some point Merry and Sam got up and walked around for a moment. Frodo felt a cold dread creeping over his heart and Sam and Merry ran back to the fire. Sam explained he suddenly felt afraid and that he felt something creeping up the slope. We again see how the presence of the Nazgul induces fear and terror. Remember the scene in the film where the insects and alike were fleeing from the Black Rider. I also got a lot of comments attesting me my foolishness for interpreting the insect scene differently when I saw it the first time. Thank you. However it basically transports this information visually but we also find hints how this fear spreads like an aura of terror in the book in scenes like these. Mary however said that he actually saw something, two or three black shapes. But how did he see them? Now here we have an interesting detail and lore reference. He saw them due to the moonlight. I can't explore this detail in all complexity here but of course sun and moon have a story too. In Tolkien's lore the world originally had neither sun nor moon but in very ancient times two powerful trees in Valinor, one golden and one silver tree. Valinor is the realm of the Valar, so to say high angels that form a god pantheon on Aman, the undying lands. Without sun and moon these blessed and divine trees were the only light source of the world together with the stars. Out of the dew of the silver tree named Telperion, the Valavarda, queen of the stars, made more stars. She is called Elbares Gilthoniel in Sindarin. We heard of her in a past episode already and the name will become important again so keep it in mind. The elves awoke in Middle Earth and the first thing they saw were the stars of Elvareth which is why they love her and her stars so much. The elves are deeply connected to them. When she made these new stars out of the dew of Telperion she also grouped some of them together and one group of seven mighty stars became a star constellation known as Valakirka in the north which is of course inspired by the great bear. Sauron's master Melkor or later known as Morgoth had his terrible strongholds in the north of Middle Earth. She placed Valakirka there to challenge the first Dark Lord and his servants and maybe to draw a line. It was also a sign of doom and in this moment when she placed her new stars the elves the firstborn awoke. 
Much happened after this, but shortly before men awoke, the two trees of Valinor were destroyed by Morgoth and Shelob's mother Ungoliant. The Valar were not aware of this until it was too late, and the first Dark Lord and Ungoliant could escape back to Middle Earth in the darkness. On their way, they also stole the three Silmarilli and murdered Finwë, the first king of the Noldor elves. A devastating strike against Aman and the elves. All that was left of the two trees was one last fruit of Laurelin, the golden tree, and one last flower of Tilperion, the silver tree. The Valar, the high angels, set them into the sky on two vessels that were each carried by a powerful Maya, becoming sun and moon. The Maya Aryan carried the sun and Tilion the moon. Considering all this, sun but also moon are foes of the first Dark Lord and of course also his most powerful servant Sauron, who later becomes the second Dark Lord. The constellation Valakirka is connected to the moon over the tree Tilperion and it's mentioned several times in the Lord of the Rings, for example in the Bree section where the hobbits hid from the Black Riders with Strider. It always watched over them from the sky you could say. The hobbits call the constellation the sickle, other folks the plough, but in this context it's also a deep lore reference that the moonlight revealed the Nazgul so that Merry could see them and warn his friends. In a way, Weathertop is a battle on multiple planes of existence. We have the lore of the tower with the history of Strider's ancestors and his own fate. We have the fateful events around Bilbo and Frodo and them being hobbits. We have Gandalf drawing four Nazgul away and even the stars and the moon battle Sauron and his servants with their might uncovering their plot. Not just that night, but for thousands of years. As said, all comes beautifully together here. With this, Aragorn, Frodo and the others were warned. Strider commanded to look outward from the fire into all directions into the dark and to get some of the longer sticks ready in their hands. The moment of confronting their foes had come. After a silence, Strider saw a darkness rising in the shadows and he and the hobbits could make out three or four hard to see shapes in the dark. Tolkien described it with so black were they that they seemed like black holes in the deep shade behind them. Then they slowly advanced. Merry and Pippin threw themselves flat on the ground in terror and Sam got closer to Frodo's side in fear. Frodo was almost as terrified as his friends, but the desire to put on the one ring overcame him. Not that he thought it would help him, it was just a need he had to satisfy. And all the advice he got from Gandalf simply had no merit or weight anymore. Sam saw his master struggling, but could not stop him. And so he put the one ring onto the forefinger of his left hand. The others could not see him anymore, but now he could see the five tall figures even through the cloaks with silver helmets and haggard hands and one had a crown. They, three of them to be precise, two were standing on the lip of the dell, rushed towards him and Frodo did something incredible. Maybe the lost rider told him and the song brought courage into his heart. He drew his barrel blade. As we learned, a sword or dagger actually suitable to fight and hurt even a Nazgul. In the unseen, as mentioned, it was glowing red like a firebrand. It was not an ordinary blade. And again, we find another very small detail in the book. Two of the ring rays halted. Only the one with a crown continued, which is of course the Witch King. He drew his Morgul knife. We can read, the knife and his hand had a pale glow. For the films all of the ring rays have this pale glow, which makes perfectly sense when it comes to visuals for a film and here is the book reference for it. The Witch King now sprang forward to attack Frodo and pierce his heart with a Morgul knife, which would transform Frodo into a lesser race. But Frodo did again something incredible. Keep the courage and comfort in mind, Strider tried to wake in the hobbits. Quote, 
At the moment, Frodo threw himself forward on the ground and he heard himself crying aloud, O Elberes Gilthorniel, at the same time he struck at the feet of his enemy. Frodo attacked the Witch King too and called for Elberes, the foe of Morgoth, the first Dark Lord, and now Sauron, the second Dark Lord. A shrill cry rang out in the night and he felt a pain like a dart of poisoned ice pierce his left shoulder. Because he attacked the Witch King with a barrow blade, also calling for Elberes, the Witch King missed Frodo's heart with his knife and only pierced his shoulder. Just think about this, all what I've said in all those episodes until now and all the law, every little detail, everything led to this point, where the Witch King misses Frodo's heart just by a few centimeters. Frodo was invisible, he would have become a race, Strider and the others could not have seen the attack, the One Ring or the corpse of Frodo, Sauron would have won here. Imagine Mary would have not seen three shades in the moonlight and the group got suddenly surprise attacked. But Frodo lived thanks to all of this. What an amazing story. But what happens next? Strider suddenly sprang out of the darkness with a torch in either hand and attacked the shades and with his last strength Frodo pulled the ring from his finger and kept it tied in his right hand. From the perspective of Sam, Frodo was suddenly gone and an almost invisible black shade ran past him. Then he heard a cry from Frodo but it seemed to come from a great distance or from under the earth crying out strange words. And suddenly he reappeared lying in the mud. He thought Frodo was dead but he came back to consciousness after a while. And what Strider did was quite impressive too. It seems like he managed to somewhat surprise the ring race too. The film shows him coming out of nowhere to help the wounded Frodo and drive the Nazgul away too with fire and his sword. In the book I assume Strider fights only briefly with them using his torches. His broken sword is not mentioned but maybe he drew it too for a moment. There is not much detail on what he did. The Nazgul then just retreated and Aragorn goes back into the dark after them. He really has no fear. Can you imagine being attacked by almost invisible beings in the dark who can turn you into wraiths out of nowhere and also have a supernatural terrifying aura and and are servants of basically the devil or the closest servant of the devil who in addition have the most power in the dark and you know all of this in all the details and go still after them alone? I can't but as Gandalf said, Aragorn the greatest traveler and huntsman of this age of the world. But why did the Nazgul retreat? They had no casualties, the attack of Frodo was deflected by the Witch King's leg brace. Their enemy has one wounded person and they know definitely that they have the one ring. Why stop here? Because they were actually afraid. As mentioned, two of them also halted when they began their attack and Frodo drew his sword. This was not going as planned at all for the Nazgul. They were also not complete. The ring bearer and his friends all had barrel blades, one of the few weapons that could actually become dangerous for them and which would mean that the group was powerful enough to destroy the barrel whites. The bearer did not give up in terror but used the one ring to see them and counter attacked so that the attack of the Witch King, Sauron's highest and most powerful servant missed. There is fire and torches which they fear too and there is a strange ranger dude with Narsil. The name Narsil means red and white flame which is a reference to sun and moon and a blade even Sauron fears and shows that he must be Isildur's heir who is also able to somewhat sneak up to them in the dark and is even chasing them alone because he actually has no fear at all and the bearer in addition called for Elbereth, a foe of the Dark Lord, so he must have some connection to the elves. That impressed the Nazgul who did not expect this at all. They thought that their prey's hide and seek game would have an end here and that they would easily sneak up and kill all of them fast. They underestimated their enemies and retreat was the smartest option for now. However, the ring rays were still in a very good position. The bearer was 
heavily wounded and will most likely die at some point and in the open field they can attack anyway and have an advantage especially when the other 4 Nazgul are back. Nothing was lost so they decided to not risk a further attack and wait. Rivendell is still about 2 weeks of travel from Weathertop. They are in the middle of nowhere. What they don't know, even Strider was surprised, they did not come back and finish the job and that Frodo was incredibly tough. The campfire, our hero's last line of defense, somewhat hold and Frodo is still alive. The plan of the Nazgul didn't work out and they now have some respect for their opponents. They probably also assumed that Gandalf could be still around but the further journey is a topic for next episode. Thank you for watching. This video got quite long but it's also one of my favorite parts in the book and I try to do it justice. I hope you enjoyed it and that I could share my passion for this section. If you liked the video feel free to press the like button, leave a comment and recommend me further. Maybe check my other videos too, be it Tolkien or gaming related if you're interested. I also link some playlists in the description including the one for this series. In case you want to subscribe and notified when I upload something new, consider pressing the annoying bell. Next on my channel will be most likely one more Tolkien related video and a gaming related video, whatever comes first. I also want to finish Final Fantasy 7 on stream this month. So if you are into this feel free to join. I stream on Twitch, I try to stream once or twice a week. In addition you can follow me on Twitter and I also have a Discord server. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.